Yes. So do you predict cultural effects for any of these measures? I would predict, um, consistent with other kind of cross-cultural work on these gender differences, that culture, culture would moderate the size of the gender difference, but very rarely flip it. You wouldn't expect, I wouldn't expect it to be flipped, but you might expect that in, in, I would expect that in highly patriarchal cultures, I feel like I've say, seen this kind of effect in, in different kinds of gender difference work, that in highly patriarchal cultures, you should see a bigger effect. And in more egalitarian cultures, you might see a less effect. That would be my speculation. But, but uh, that the sort of the average across cultures would be consistent with this, but that culture would moderate the size of it. That would be my, my guess. Other thoughts, questions? Dan? So it's always easy to sit on the sidelines and say, here's, you know, here's what you should do next. Um, I'm, I'm open. It, um, it strikes me that you know, there, there are negative affordances of being in Los Angeles. So um, probably people get more attractive um, with time as a function of their accessing plastic surgery and all the other technologies available here that they don't have in Ohio um, to the same extent. But it's true. There, there are positive affordances also, which is that we have um, large gay and lesbian communities here. Ah. And, um, if it's the case that men's evaluation of their partners is more contingent on attractiveness, so going back to the initial premise, oh, I really like women's it. evaluation, yeah. then in same-sex long-term relationships, you would expect that relationship satisfaction is going to be more contingent on the match between the attractiveness of the partners, because that's going to affect, as you point out, the dyad and how the dyad relationship works out than is true in female same-sex work. That's great. That's great. So in the heterosexual couples that we've studied to date, the relative uh, difference works because men are getting something they want and women aren't losing something that they don't want. But in a same-sex relationship, that would get flipped. And that uh, any kind of sim dissimilarity in a male, male relationship means there's uh, one person who's unhappy, who's going to sort of make everybody unhappy. But in a female-female, I get it. I like it. I'd love to do that. OK, let's totally do that. That's a great idea, Dan. I love that. Any other thoughts uh, uh, or critiques or um, reactions? Marty? So um, uh, what are people at Eastwood saying about, about these data? So you, you made the argument that they've been building a case yes. for arguing They have. And I know that you're pals with them. I am. So I assume that you've had a conversation about this. We have. And so Paul Eastwick's reaction is, what do you have against me? Why, what, I'm trying to get a paper published here, because he's got a big meta-analysis. And uh, my, I'm very conflict-averse. So I said to him, you know, is it possible that in your meta-analysis, you could do a study, you could look at moderation by long-term versus short-term relationship being studied? So. Um, and, and you know, I don't know if he's going to go and do that, but th they've looked at th they've looked at a bunch of studies and tried to meta-analyze them and say, look, there's not any real significant gender difference. But when I look at his, their data, and I haven't read, I haven't like done their meta-analysis for them, but, but I've, when I, what, I, what I've seen of it so far suggests that most of the studies that they're entering into the meta-analysis are studies of short-term mating and dating and stuff like that. There aren't that many long-term relationships, relationship studies that have, that have good objective physical appearance data. That's why I'm happy to, if I thought this was boring, I wouldn't tell you about it. So, so um, we're talking to them. It's very polite. I still love them. Um, but they haven't come out and said, you're right, we're going to not do what we're doing. Isn't that, isn't that the way? <laughs> yes? How old are the average married couples? In this study? Yeah. In, in, across these four studies, these are first married, newlywed couples. Right. So their age at time one, and all of them are four-year studies, the age at time one um, is about, ranges from 24 to 27 for wives across the four studies, and like 25 to 28 for husbands across the four studies. Because over time, as we've been doing these studies, the age, the average age of marriage for college-educated white people has been actually going up, not, not insignificantly. Really? And, uh, you know, I don't know that much about this literature, but presumably what you find important in mate changes over time with age as well. That's a right? really good and point. I'm, you know, I'm aware of one study 
that has looked at, well, okay, I'll tell you. I'm aware of one study that's been published that looks at physical attractiveness related to marital satisfaction in elderly, like in late in life, like in old, much older people. And it says, oh, look, older people are happier when their partners are more attractive. Uh, but it was self-ratings of attractiveness, and they didn't control for health. So in, old, I mean, in, in these studies, I didn't control for health either, but there wasn't a lot of variability in health. These are all young, healthy people. But in older people, you could imagine a really strong uh, uh, correlation that would be a confound, that if my partner is more attractive, they might also be a lot healthier, and that might mean our relationship is a lot nicer. We don't have as many stresses in our life. So I'm not sure how much I buy that. Uh, so, but, and I, none of that's to disagree with you. I think that your uh, intuition that the role of physical attractiveness might well change over time. I was just thinking it also gets confounded with different variables over time, too. It's a good thing to study. I wouldn't generalize beyond the young couples that I've studied here. Marty? Just one um, pertinent point. Um, the BUS 37 Cultures study, um, those folks were not undergraduate age. They, they huh. were older in age. So this is the sex difference of physical attractiveness that was robust in that study applies to older adults. Thanks, Marty. Question? Um, so I know that you said people tend to match uh, for their attractiveness, but there are some differences. Are they usually? Do they go both ways at the same rate, or is there generally one Well, we can address that here, right? So, so we looked at the distribution of the different scores, mm -hmm. and we found just about a nice normal distribution. So within these 400 and something couples, there was a lot of you know, clumping around the middle, people very close to each other, and an equal number of men more attractive and an equal number of women more attractive in this study. I don't know what the distribution looks like in the population at large. Yes. A, a relatively small number of raters. There's a lot of agreement among them. Um, one thing to keep in mind, particularly if you're looking at body fat, is that, um, and there's a flip side, which is male muscularity, um, uh, which is that the, the standards of the two genders are parallel but not isomorphic. So the level of body fat that women consider, consider attractive in a woman is lower than the level of body fat that men consider attractive in a woman. Okay. And similarly, the level of muscularity that men consider attractive in a man is higher than the level of muscularity that women consider attractive in a man. I got so with if you, you have a small number of raters, um, then potentially the genders of the raters can be introducing noise Yes. Because you're rating attractiveness on bodies, for example, right? Um, yep, to the yep. extent that you're doing that in the future. Totally. Um, and so if you want to know how happy your husband's with their wives' body fat, but you have women rating the wives' body fat, then you have a source of information about the wives' body fat that doesn't parallel the criteria being used by the husband. I get it. I, my intuition is that that didn't that wouldn't be a large effect that kind of noise that wouldn't be a lot of noise from that but you're right it is a refinement that could could happen and in these studies i dare say the vast majority of our raters across studies were women undergraduates because the vast majority of our RAs in our history have been women undergraduates because the vast majority of psych departments uh, of psych undergraduates who are volunteering to be TAs are women so um, that's, there's not that much noise, even in our study. But we didn't control for it at all. That's true. Joe. Uh, I want to follow up again on, 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 on Clayton's question. I mean, he asked if he had any questions about adultery. Yeah. But were there any, were there any questions about um, sort of free-floating jealousy? Because what, what occurs to me when I think about disparities between spouses in mate value, which attractiveness or, or anything else that contributes to mate value, 100%. when I think of a couple where there's a great deal of disparity, I think, well, the partner who's lower is going to be, uh, is going to be worried that the yep. other partner is going to leave, and, and, and that's going to have all sorts of effects on... Um, I get and, that. And, and especially in your, you know, your conversation, that, that communication video coding. Totally. So did you, 
aside from just satisfaction, did you have any items that tapped um, jealousy, free-floating jealousy? I mean, okay, first of all, we didn't analyze it. But if I think about these data sets, there is, uh, there, are, there are a couple sets of relevant items. One is uh, we ask people, to what extent is jealousy or, or uh, a problem in your relationship? It's a single item in a list of, to what extent are X, Y, and Z problems in your relationship? And jealousy is one of those things. The problem is that we don't, the question doesn't say who's jealousy. So that's not so good. What we do have questions about is what I would say is the flip side. You're not going to be satisfied with this because it's not about jealousy per se, which is really about alternative partners. Well, we have questions about commitment. And that's the flip side, right? So it's instead of saying, I'm worried that you're not committed, which is jealousy, I have questions about how committed are you? And the idea, which we haven't tested, would be that if I am in a relationship with someone that I think is somehow beneath me, because I'm more attractive than you, why would I stay with you when I'm more attractive? I should be less committed to the relationship. And one of the reasons we haven't studied that is that those self-reports of commitment are highly correlated with self-reports of satisfaction. And it's very hard to tease those things apart because in terms of self-reports on the paper and pencil, they're practically the same thing. But uh, that's, that's in the neighborhood of the kind of issues that you're thinking about, is that if I'm over-benefited, I, I would be so committed to your happiness, and I'd be committed to the relationship too, if I'm under-benefited, I would be less committed, and presumably then looking elsewhere. Clayton. Well, the reason I asked the convergence question, convergence question is yeah. part of my intuition, whether it's incorrect or not, is that one subject in the couple could converge on the other, that is being weighed possibly as a signaling function of fidelity. I like it. I like it. So <clears throat> it, it the weight thing is what we've been developing lately. And, the, and less of an issue of how weight predicts relationship, but how the relationship predicts weight. And, uh, and how people in their relationships can facilitate or inhibit other people's weight-related goals. And indeed, I really, I think, uh, we have seen in the videos, it turns out that in those social support videotapes, where people say, here's something I'm working on, here's something you're working on, over half of the people, they could pick anything they want. They could pick, oh, I'm working on my career, I'm working on getting through graduate school, I'm working on my next book. Half the time, what are they working on? Wait. Half of the time they're talking about going to the gym more, or eating right, or getting more exercise, or just wanting to lose weight. Half the time. So uh, my collaborator, Tom Bradbury, and I are now working on uh, a book about this topic, which is how do couples communicate about their weight-related goals. And we are absolutely seeing that when somebody says, honey, I'm trying to lose weight, there's a real variety of reactions. On one hand, I can say, that's so great. You're going to live longer. That means longer life for us. You're going to see our kids. You're going to have more energy. That's going to be fantastic. But that's not the only thing we see. We also see, yeah, you're trying to lose weight. Why? Who are you trying to impress? <laughs> I'm fine. I think you look great. I don't have a problem with how you look. Why would you want to lose weight when I'm, I'm totally fine with how you look? So tell me again why you're trying to lose weight, because I'm fine with it. Like, we get that. We see that on the tapes. And it's that latter example that I think is exactly s consistent with this idea of weight as a signal, that where weight loss is a signal that I'm, you know, holding my options open, which leads us to, we do have done a study. This is, does this get published? I think it's, it's in press now, where we uh, looked at the fluctuation between weight and satisfaction over time. So we have variability from point to point in weight and variability in point to point in satisfaction. And the question is, are those two things associated? Does, my, does, does the weight of these spouses co-vary with their satisfaction? The answer is yes. Now the real question is, what's the direction of the effect? Is it that when I'm happier, I'm able to maintain my weight better? Or is it that when I'm happier, I have less motivation to maintain my weight. Which is it? It's the latter. Consistent. It's the latter. Is that happier spouses gain weight. And uh, the ones who are less happy or distressed lose weight. Now, there's different mechanisms. I don't claim to know the mechanism there. One mechanism could be distress is stressful, and so I'm getting less sleep, so I just lose weight because I'm stressed. Or it could be a motivational thing. That 
you know what, this doesn't work out so well, I better maintain my attractiveness and, and my weight because you never know, I might have to go. Oh, in fact, we did look at the mechanism. We actually looked at fluctuations in, as, in commitment as a mediator and found it. found it. So that's all consistent with your intuition. But luckily, we have already done that work. So, <laughs> um, Thank you so much. Oh, no, Mar Marty, another question? Well, I'm fine. I'm just wondering how wealth figures in here. Wealth. Um, so could it be the case that, uh, are we running? Oh, no, I'm, 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 I'm. Um, Really, that's inter so, so interesting. You know, there are lots of different benefits you can get from a partner. Um, well, one is that they have a stable job and contribute to the household. If they're not doing that, then they've got to look good. I totally see it. I totally see that. So you're saying that, that um, you might see a flip, a, a flip in the gender difference if the wife is saying, look, I'm actually making all the money. Now, what's interesting about that, Marty, is that we are studying our, our current studies. <coughs> These are four-year studies that are over. There's no data collection happening. Our current ongoing data collection is on very low-income couples in low-income neighborhoods in Los Angeles, mostly Hispanic and some black and some white, but all low-income. And in these, are, these are populations where it's quite possible that women are making more money than men because low-income, the rates of male unemployment are very high in these populations, where rates of female unemployment are lower. So it's, these are families, unlike in these families, where it's quite possible that women are making more money. So we could test this intuition that you have, which is that if the woman is saying, look, I'm making the money, I'm actually bringing in money, then I would be more responsive to, if you then are making no money and you're gaining weight, what's in it for me here? So that's a very interesting, which we can totally test. That's a great idea, but we haven't tested. Thank you again for having me.